last Sunday, several rockets were fired from a Ukrainian territory hitting a beach in Sevastopol on Crimea, killing five civilians and injuring over 100. The strikes were apparently carried out with US-supplied attackers. Russia has said that it held Washington directly responsible for these attacks. While Washington, on the other hand, says that Ukraine makes its own targeting decisions and, of course, blames Russia for having started and sustaining the war in the first place. Now, just to be clear on what this means for the escalation between the two sides, let me play to you a clip from three weeks ago when Vladimir Putin gave a press conference and talked explicitly about the use of attackums and storm shadow missiles in the war. I am showing you this to make it clear what Putin publicly said about these systems and how the targeting works according to his understanding. The clip is about five minutes long, but please have a watch. From the perspective of the presence of advisors and instructors, there is nothing new here. They are present on the territory of Ukraine. And unfortunately for them, they are suffering losses. I know this for sure. This is not done on purpose, but in the course of combat operations, losses occur. However, in European countries and in the States, they prefer to keep this quiet. That's the first point. The second point concerns long-range precision weapons. Here, this topic needs to be divided into two parts. The first is conventional weapons, long-range multiple launch rocket systems, 70 kilometers and something similar, but they have been used for a long time. And indeed, Ukrainian servicemen can do this independently. But what about modern high-tech weapons, such as the British Storm Shadow, the American ATMS, or French missiles? What can be said here? I've already talked about this, by the way, I think when I was leaving Uzbekistan, but the ATAC-MS with a range of 300 kilometers. How are they used? How are they transferred? They handed over the missile system. The Pentagon handed it over. The Americans handed it over. But how to use it? Ukrainian servicemen cannot do everything independently. They are simply not technologically capable of doing this. For this, you need to have satellite reconnaissance. Then, based on this satellite reconnaissance, which is American satellite reconnaissance, you form a flight mission and input it into the missile system. The serviceman nearby does this automatically by pressing buttons. He may not even know what will happen next. How can Ukrainian servicemen participate? Not those who sit and press buttons, but at a higher level. In choosing the target, they can say which target is a priority and necessary for them. But they do not decide whether to strike this target or not. Because I repeat, the flight mission is formed and introduced only by those who supply this weapon. If it's ATAC MS, then it's done by the Pentagon. If it's Storm Shadow, then it's done by the British. Moreover, in the case of Storm Shadow, it's even simpler. Flight missions are introduced automatically without the involvement of ground personnel. The British do this. But when the military thought about whether to strike the Crimean Bridge or other targets, they decided for themselves. No one thought for them, right? That's what they were planning to do. The same applies to French specialists. Western specialists are doing this. Therefore, we have no illusions about this. What should we do in response? First, we will certainly improve our air defense systems and destroy them. Second, we are considering that if someone deems it possible to supply such weapons to the combat zone to strike our territory and create problems for us, then why don't we have the right to supply our weapons of the same class to those regions of the world where strikes will be made on sensitive targets of those countries that are doing this against Russia? That is, the response may be asymmetrical. 
we will think about it. And thirdly, of course, such actions will completely destroy international relations and undermine international security. Ultimately, if we see that these countries are getting involved in a war against us, and this is their direct participation in a war against the Russian Federation, then we reserve the right to act in a similar manner. In general, this is a path to very serious problems. That's probably all. If you have any questions, please. But I think I can hardly add anything. Now, is what Mr. Putin explained factually correct? And what does it mean? And I must say, I don't know. I'm not a military expert. I don't know if this is actually true, what he's saying, um, whether it actually, whether the all of the, uh, the, the information is actually being supplied by the United States, whether the US, in order to launch attacks, actually has to input all of this data and, and US satellites are used. I don't know. It seems plausible, but I can tell you. The one thing I can tell you is that this is what Vladimir Putin thinks he has to communicate to the uh, Russian general population. And this is, this is how he is portraying the situation in general. It can be true, it can, it, it, it can, be, fair, it can be false, but this is the understanding of the Russians and of the, of the Russians in general. Now, what does this lead to? It is, of course, a, a quite a problem because um, if you then have an attack like what we had the other day, um, of course, Vladimir Putin and the Russians in general and the Kremlin will be forced to go along and say like, yes, this was this was the United States that was responsible for this because this is something that they have already established, right? And here, whether or not this is true doesn't matter anymore. We now have political um, a political necessity for further speech acts into one direction. And now, um, if you look at what happened in, in Crimea, um, one thing stands out, which is that the... The place where that was under attack is this was this beach over here, um, as far as I understand, in Uchkuyev in Uchkuyevka, somewhere probably somewhere along this beach. I couldn't really identify at which at which place, but from the news um, that I that I read, it was it was along here. And the the important thing about this one is that it is very very close in very close proximity to the port of Sevastopol, um, which is also being used for, for, for the Russian Navy. Um, so, you know, these are just a few kilometers away. Now, w is it possible that Ukraine was targeting actually the, um, the Navy base and tried to hit a military target, but that just the, the rockets were intercepted and then, and then crash landed um, or, or um, detonated over the beach. Yes, that's possible. On the other hand, we, it was a Sunday afternoon on a sunny early, uh, early summer early summer day where a lot of people would be naturally at the beach and this is a very strange timing for any kind of such such attack so instead of doing it at night or doing it at a, at a time in the early morning hours um, this might have been a deliberate attack on uh, on this beach it might have been an accident that's another one of these things that we don't know and um, was it a deliberate attack on the beach by the United States, programmed by the United States? Or was it the Ukrainians who actually chose this target? That's another thing. We, we don't know. Is it possible that the Ukrainians actually told the Americans we want to attack Sevastopol, the port, uh, knowing that there's a good chance that this might cause some casualties at this beach? because they know more about, about this area than the Americans, and the Americans deliver, gave to them everything they needed to attack the Sevastopol, the, the military base, and then uh, the, the, this, this happened, is also, we don't know what the decision-making um, uh, reasons were. The only thing we can, we can say for certain is that now we have a situation in which a lot of Russian civilians died um, in, in Crimea, and that this is now something that is on the mind of many Russian uh, Russians in, in on the mainland that will only harden their resolve and that will force the hand of Vladimir Putin to do something about it. Maybe what he has said in that in that previous interview that he will now supply 
uh, weapons to, to adversaries of the United States in, in other areas of the world. And this is what, what then drives this constant escalation. So whether or not this was a deliberate attack doesn't even matter that much anymore. The fact that we had this incident now will drive down the road further escalation. This is why it is so absolutely imperative that these different powers, the Russians, the Americans, uh, actually come up with diplomatic solutions to each other. And I do pray that there is some backdoor diplomacy going on between the Russians and the Americans in order to clarify that I hope this was not a deliberate, deliberate attack in order to pacify uh, each other at least a little bit. But, you know, you need to set boundaries. You need to set rules for, for engagement. And it is clear that under international humanitarian law, of course, civilians and civilian infrastructure is, cannot be targeted. Um, and I would hope that this is not some form of very thick game to goad the Russians into uh, a direct attack on NATO territory. It might be such, but it might also just be one more of these un unforeseen um, incidences that tend to happen a lot during war. But even those incidences can then lead to further escal escalation, um, which, it was wh which is why it is so important to have um, communication up and running and also have like red lines where, you're, where you communicate to the other side that this is something that we wouldn't do. This is, this is an accident. Um, it might be that this is a goating of the, of the Russians. Uh, we don't know. It's just very sad to see that this is another, another piece in the puzzle of a potential Third World War.